Hey, it's Mike here, and today, air meat. Yes, meat that is actually made from thin air, and it's so much more than that, we'll get into it. We're taking breatharianism to the next level beyond just starving hippies and con artists. We're gonna look at this new startup out of San Francisco, which is called Air Protein. They're building on NASA technology to potentially create super sustainable vegan protein as well as carbs and fats. We're gonna get into the science of how this works, but I'm gonna keep it pretty simple despite some Pretty technical things. We're also going to investigate, you know, how healthy is this stuff going to be, as well as will this be the future of food? Will this happen soon? All that good stuff. Let's go. So this company, Air Protein, out of San Francisco, was founded in 2019. It slipped under my radar until it recently raised $32 million. So they got some good funding. This is officially happening. I mean, you already breathe there. Why not eat it? As one TikTok commenter mentioned, this is the premise of cloudy with the chance of meatballs. In this case, vegan meatballs. Hey, wherever you get your inspiration, go for it. The concept of making meat from air isn't really that crazy when you consider how plants work. A simple example is the air fern, which makes it so obvious how much of plant biomass comes directly from the air. We like to think that soil mass is what turns into plant mass, but it's mostly coming from the air in the form of that nitrogen and that CO2. Just, just like how when you burn fat, you breathe out that carbon. We're gonna cover all the chemistry behind that, but first let's look at the founder of the company, PhD holder, Lisa Dyson, who has a super impressive resume. And in terms of what the food actually is here, she is talking about all the different things they can make on the TED stage. And what would be the products of this new type of agriculture? Well, we've already made a protein meal. So you can imagine uh, something similar to a soybean meal, or even corn meal or wheat flour. We've already made oils, so you can imagine something similar to coconut oil or olive oil or soybean oil. So yeah, this company can clearly make a variety of products, one which they claim has 80% protein in it, and it also is things like flowers and so on. And here is a picture of the meat that they made, and it looks just like chicken, it's convincing. Is the watermark included on the actual product? I'm being told that every grain of their flour has its own tiny watermark. All right, now for how it actually works, the tech behind it, and all goes back to NASA in the 60s, trying to figure out how they can feed astronauts on long space flights that are up to a year or more, and how to deal with the carbon problem where they need to intake carbon and they don't have an endless source of carbon, so this is a way of carbon recycling through what are known as hydrogenotrophs. These are bacteria or archaea who usually hang out in places like volcanic vents or even in your digestive system, as well as in the gums of people with periodontal disease and so many more places. And for the difference between archaea and bacteria, you can pause here. I know it's a little nuanced. And it sounds complicated, but hydrogen atroph can simply be broken down to hydrogen and troph, which just means that it eats hydrogen. From this paper, they say, quote, an example of hydrogenotrophy is performed by carbon dioxide reducing organisms as they utilize carbon dioxide and hydrogen to produce methane, which can happen through a few metabolic pathways. Because of this, they can often be referred to as a type of methanogenic organism or methane generating organism. I know this is getting complicated. Well, some of these organisms break down cellulose into methane in the gut of a ruminant animal like a cow. Here is the equation for the metabolism that they have. It's an anaerobic metabolism, which means without oxygen, and they take that CO2 as well as four hydrogen molecules and through their metabolism, turn it into CH4, which is methane, and two water molecules. So a farm where this takes place might look like a bunch of oxygen deprived tanks, kind of like a brewery, but if you wanna throw some more imagination in there, it could be a giant vertical tunnel under a city that is operated by robots. According to Dyson, these hydrogenotrophs can convert carbon into food more efficiently than plants. I would like to see a direct comparison to algae, for example, or where the numbers come from. And this brings me to the catch here, which I haven't seen anybody else mention in any articles or anything like that. And that is that one of the inputs is molecular hydrogen, which of course requires energy to create. And then you're creating methane, AKA natural gas, which is a very powerful greenhouse gas. So you have to deal with that. However, you could just burn it back down into carbon dioxide and feed that as well. But it all comes down to where that original energy source that makes the hydrogen comes from. 
Obviously this isn't super abundant, otherwise we'd just be driving around hydrogen cars. And we have a couple options here for making the hydrogen. Of course you have hydrolysis, which uses electricity to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. And then you have the hydrogen you can use, or you can take the methane byproduct and by adding a ton of heat and some pressure, you can do what is called natural gas reforming, where you basically reverse the reaction and create the hydrogen and carbon dioxide. Again, it requires some steam as well. So it's, it's 700 degrees Celsius or about 1300 degrees Fahrenheit, again, energy. <laughs> Of course, you could use solar or other renewable energy to create that hydrogen, which just makes this a lot like electric cars in the sense that they are as eco as what is fueling them as the energy source. Coal powered food is not a good look. You know, maybe down the line when we have thorium nuclear power, so we don't have really dangerous nuclear waste, we could be using that for this. Just throwing ideas against the wall, but you might be thinking what I was wondering is, is this another situation where they have to genetically modify that organism to create these particular end products? And I was surprised to see, that unlike so many new products that are coming out, the company directly claims they don't use genetically modified organisms. So that means that they were able to find naturally occurring organisms that produce all these things they want, that protein, that fat, these oils. They say air protein is produced by all natural processes, which brings me to the actual protein itself. How do they make that protein? And let's just go right to the website. They say, quote, Air protein flour is a complete protein containing all nine of the essential amino acids necessary for the human diet with an amino acid profile comparable to animal protein and double the amount of amino acids compared to protein made from soybeans. Of course, these organisms are taking the carbon from the CO2 that they eat and turning it into protein, but protein also requires nitrogen. So where are they getting this nitrogen from? If you've watched some of my videos in the past, I've talked about nitrogen fixation from the atmosphere where you capture nitrogen from the atmosphere. This is what legumes do in their roots. They have little nodules and a symbiotic relationship with a nitrogen fixing bacteria. That's anaerobic as well. They feed those bacteria some glucose and then they use that energy to fix the nitrogen from the atmosphere, which is a somewhat energy intense process. So we only have three options for our nitrogen source that I can think of at least. We have synthetic fertilizer, which is created from fossil fuels, or you have waste products, or you have nitrogen fixation through some type of bacteria. And it said all natural process, so it has to be either number two or number three. So the question is, do these organisms fix nitrogen? Well, from this paper, it appears that they are major contributors to nitrogen fixation in the Everglades. So surely this is possible. The atmosphere is 70% nitrogen after all. And the nail in the coffin here, I think, is this 2020 paper titled Microbial Protein Out of Thin Air actually highlights the process in the realm of food. Linked below for nerds who want to check it out as well as everything else. So while they don't give away all the details of their process, I'm almost entirely sure this is how the protein is being made. It's just the most efficient way. It makes sense. They can do it, so why wouldn't they use it? And this brings me to things like other nutrients, vitamins, minerals, and the question of whether there's B12 in this, which would make it you know, more nutritionally complete. And I actually searched for too long going through the literature on whether or not these hydrogenotrophs can make B12 only to realize that the website directly says their product is quote, rich in vitamins and minerals and jam packed with nutrients, including many B vitamins, niacin, thiamine, rhioboflavin, and B6, including B12. Now B12 is made by some anaerobic bacteria as well. So it makes sense that this would be the case. Also, they could just add it if it's not the case. I don't know what they're considering naturally occurring or not. Next up has to do with the fat aspect. And we began cultivating them even further and we found that we could make oil. And we made an oil that's similar to palm oil. And palm oil is used to manufacture a wide range of consumer and industrial goods. And this was a very pleasant surprise that I was not expecting researching this and that they were able to create what is functionally the same as palm oil. You know I'm not a huge oil advocate for health, but in terms of the environment, I mean, the Amazon rainforest has cattle. The Sumatran rainforest has palm oil destroying it and kills a ton of orangutans. It's not good, but if they can replace it sustainably, then that would be amazing. Now the shelf stability and the qualities of palm oil has led it to become a staple in a ton of foods, a growing amount of foods, which isn't exciting. I'm not happy about it, but if we can cut into that, then we can at least 
save some Sumatran orangutans. They're so cute. And that segues directly into the general environmental impact of air protein and directly from her on the TED stage. Is that modern agriculture is one of the largest emitters of greenhouse gases. In fact, it emits more greenhouse gases than our cars, our trucks, our planes, and our trains combined. So to some extent, this is about replacing animal agriculture and feeding the future human population. And the website does make some claims without any, any sources, but they say that uh, it uses one and a half million times less land than beef, 15,000 times less water than beef. I think they meant it was CO2 sequestering versus emitting excessive amounts of greenhouse gases. And of course, able to be vertically scaled, not peer reviewed, but it goes without saying that if they were to get the energy aspect under control, you know, they already have that land use that would be super low for this as well as water use that would be super low for this. So they're set up to be super eco-friendly if they can pull it off. Now the question is, is this gonna be a healthy food? They seem to have a few different things they can produce, but there's not any fiber that is involved in this at all, because it's not from a plant, but there will be some type of cellular membrane here. I'm not sure if the flour is made up of the intact organisms or something that's ground up. It's probably gonna be absorbed faster than plant products though, which means that it would have more of an intense effect on the body, whether it is carbohydrates, fats, or proteins. So yeah, the protein in high enough amounts, like four grams of leucine that I always talk about, could drive up IGF-1, which again, could be a cancer concern if you're eating a lot of it. And then you have oils potentially doing some arterial impairment. And you of course have sugars being digested quicker. It appears they're complex carbohydrates like flour, but then if you're talking about things like refined starches, like sort of like how white rice can be digested quickly into glucose, then that's not super healthy there as well. But this isn't gonna have cholesterol. They probably are gonna have a choice of having saturated fat or not, which means it's gonna raise cholesterol or not raise cholesterol depending on the product. So if this is eaten with other healthy food, like plant-based products, I think it could be fine in terms of a healthier diet, but I don't think that this is gonna be a super health food. Next, I just have to ask, will this be the future of humanity's food? In a hundred years from now, will we be eating 100% nuclear hydrolysis based hydrogenotroph cakes and burgers? This is how we turn into gray aliens, man. Now we can live in space forever in 200,000 years from now. Gray aliens are gonna have to come back in time to harvest human DNA that actually still works, bro. Obviously I'm joking, but I do think this is a great way to diversify the human food supply. I mean, if you could replace the entire meat supply chain with this today, by pressing a button, I would press that button. No animals are harmed. The more I think about it, it really is like the electric car of food, again, it depends on where you're getting the source of energy. And then also like, I wanna be driving around that car, but I still wanna be eating plants that are whole and healthy and interesting, just like how I wanna keep walking around for transportation. The next question is, will this happen soon? And I would venture to say, probably not super soon. We're probably gonna see like samples of this food or some products here and there, but I don't think it's gonna take over quickly. And that just has to do with, well, it is really efficient in terms of like biochemical things. I don't think it's gonna be a financially efficient way to grow food. And this brings me back to my undergrad sustainability degree where I did a project on algae biofuel and designing different reactors to grow algae for fuel. And it became clear after I spent a bunch of time with all these complicated methods of you know, growing it underground where you use parabolic reflectors to shoot the light in, that it was just way less efficient and feasible than just an open pond of algae that gets you know scraped up every once in a while. And yes, this picture from over a decade ago does make me laugh. Should I grow my hair out? Only eight months of awkward stage. Let me know in the comments below. Saying all this to say, you know, Dyson has claimed that they can produce 10,000 times as much food on the same amount of land as a soy field, but does that require, you know, constant lab techs, checking the temperature, a ton of like stainless steel equipment and so forth compared to just plopping down some soybeans, you know, spraying some stuff and harvesting them, which is the current conventional way of growing them. And then on top of that, are you gonna have to do all this methane reclamation stuff as well as of course making that hydrogen and processing it into whatever food, like this could be a very involved process or they could figure out to make it not that involved. I don't know. That being said, I absolutely think it is worth funding and developing this for so many reasons. And all of these things being said, 
I would absolutely love to just try this, see what it tastes like. If it tastes good, I would probably incorporate it into my diet, depending on which product it is. So in the end, this just appears like another interesting way to diversify the world's food supply, be more sustainable, feed the future human population and so forth. I would just love to see this stuff, but you know, in time. So let me know down below what you think about all of this. Do you think you're gonna be eating hydrogenotrophic food in the future? Let's just call it air protein. That's, that's a better word. All right, that's it for today. Feel free to like, subscribe, eat some air, hit the notification bell, all that good stuff. And I'll see you in the next one. I, right here, I have their official slogan, which I hear is from thin air to thick meat. That can't be right. Who put that slogan in my notes? Now I'm gonna be demonetized. Hey, reviewers, that was literal.